<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Here we are, the very last session of the 2021 Humans to Mars Summit uh, from Explore Mars. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society, where I host Planetary Radio, our uh, weekly podcast and uh, public radio series. And uh, it has once again been thrilling to be a part of H2M. I hope that you have been as fascinated, as astounded, uh, and as amazed, and uh, that maybe you've had your confidence in our ability to uh, visit the Red Planet raised as, as much as I have, as much as I have at every one of these H2M gatherings. Uh, we are going to go into what has become kind of the traditional closing session of H2M. And as you've probably seen, it's simply called Why Mars? We have a terrific panel for you. Each one of them is going to give you a very brief presentation about why they believe Mars should be an important part of the human future. Uh, to help us get uh, into that, we're going to look to the president of Explore Mars, Janet Ivey. Janet, take it away. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to all of you great panelists who are gathered here. I'm going to go kind of round robin in a brief a moment of introduction. First off, we have Dr. Jim Garvin. He is NASA Chief Scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and he is already himself a Martian, at least that is what he tells us all. There is also Dr. Greg Chavers. Uh, he is the acting deputy associate administrator at NASA, uh, including all things systems engineering and integration. Next, we have Dr. Kavya Manapu. Uh, she is also with NASA flight operations and training, especially with uh, extra vehic vehicular activities. Uh, and next, as I'm coming on down, we come to uh, Steve. Steve Sherman, oh my gosh. Stephen Sherman, for all the way from Cape Town, South Africa, his program is Living Maths. His sort of mantra is that he has been future-proofing kids for decades. Next, we have Hunter Stanchak. Everyone, after you see this, you are going to want to play the game that he has created. I'm going to leave him to tell you all about it. And last but certainly not least is my good friend, Aaron Shepard, science communicator, roboticist, and founder of Cogito. So welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. All right, then. Let's go. The question is, why Mars? Jim Garvin, you are up first. Thanks, Matt and Janet, and well, welcome to Mars. And if I can have my first slide, I want to start with really asking the question differently. And I would say it's why Mars now? Because we're in the midst of an absolute revolution in understanding our brotherly planet. In fact, it's nearly the perfect storm in the sense of going somewhere really cool to go to Mars. The scientific exploration of this world over the past 25 years has opened that frontier. We're moving, driving, flying, drilling, sampling, measuring Mars right now as we speak with robots like Perseverance you can see here, her, her partner Ingenuity giving us dronescapes of this fabulous world, tools that will allow us to ask questions about seriously whether the biosignatures that could tell us about ancient Mars that may or may not have been alive are possible there. This is the Mars we've now invented thanks to masterpieces of engineering. And that frontier 25 years ago was much murkier. But today, thanks to digital exploration, engineering by these robotic emissaries, the Mars we see is even better than we dared hoped. There's even an under Mars where part of the planet, which we don't see is likely to contain records of ancient ices and other things. So I submit to you, the why Mars is because science and engineering have given us the tools to make Mars ours. And for us as people, as explorers, changing that digital exploration pathway from that which we live now with cycles of command loops to that which we will live today with ourselves there, that's the opportunity we have. I say, Mars, here we come. Over to you, Janet. I think she's muted there, but uh, thank you, Jim. That was perfect. What a great kickoff for uh, the first of our presentations today. Thanks for bringing us the science and uh, and what's behind it. We're going to go on now to, uh, well, NASA headquarters, basically. Greg Chavers is uh, uh, going to pick up uh, with our second presentation, answering that uh, overarching question. Greg, it's all yours. 
All right. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of people ask, why do we need to send humans to Mars? Why can't we use robots to learn everything we need to learn at Mars? Well, thanks to our successful fleet of robotic missions, we've made important new discoveries about Mars, but human explorers have the benefit of intuition, rapid decision making, and dexterity that are unmatched by robots. Astronauts don't need a command loop cycle to complete tasks. Our human curiosity drives a new discovery. The most advanced robots cannot replace human understanding and emotion behind new discoveries, not just the facts, but the cumulative meaning of those discoveries. Humans are intuitive and they're able to make rapid decisions as they take in new information. We can improvise when things don't go as planned. For example, if there are adjustments or, or physical alignments needed in our ro robotics or instrumentation, an astronaut can do that real time. What can take years for a robot to accomplish on Mars could take hours for a human to accomplish. And the solar system is full of exciting destinations, but aside from Earth, Mars is the closest to being habitable. It's got day-night cycles similar to Earth. It's got seasons. Um, it's got similar terrain and, and to Earth's deserts and mountains and cliffs and valleys and dunes. And it has abundant natural resources that, that can be used, such as oxygen from ice or, or carbon dioxide. Uh, water, minerals, uh, and sunlight even. So one of NASA's long-term goals is to expand human presence into the solar system. And sending humans to Mars is the natural next step for that. And we will use the moon to help us get there. And this is America's moon to Mars exploration approach. Back to you. Thank you, Greg. That was great. Boy, that brings up so many questions. And we are hoping that we will have a few minutes left at the uh, end of all of our presentations uh, to take a few of your questions, probably not many as we head toward the end of H2M. Uh, let's go on now to our third presenter, Kavya. Thank you, Matt and Janet. It's a pleasure to be here. Why Mars? I would actually like to start off with my observations of the world in the last 18 months. Why does it have to take tragedy for us to solve a problem? Why does it have to take tragedy to address human survival? And why does it have to take tragedy for us to come together and help us transcend our boundaries? Let me pause there for a moment to sink that, for that question to sink in. Why Mars? Mars, because of its rich destination for scientific discovery, a driver for technological advancement, and a platform to really push our understanding of what we are capable of accomplishing together. Why Mars? Mars, because it would mean to really understand human survival, to sustain human life on another planet, and not just to survive, but to thrive. Why Mars? Mars, because it would mean to develop life support technologies that have to work independently of the resources from Earth, which really in turn would help us solve some of the most pressing problems on Earth for the survival of our species. Why Mars? Mars, because to expand human consciousness, that is in each of us from a mere personal identity to a global or even a cosmic identity that in, is naturally inclusive. And finally, why Mars? And Mars because it would really take more than just one person, one community, one agency or one nation to make it happen. It would really force us to see beyond our differences, working towards a common goal of making us a multi-planetary species. And really, I cannot think personally of any other greater goal that can really help us evolve as humans than making humans a multi-planetary species. And if we really need to move that needle in this direction, then let's not think of the limitations of being human, but rather focus on the immense possibilities of being a human. And Mars really provides us that frontier. And that's why Mars. 
That's a lovely message. Thank you so much, Kavya. I am hearing so many good reasons for why Mars. Uh, let's go on now to uh, where it is uh, just coming into springtime, I believe. Steve Sherman down in South Africa. Why Mars? Why Mars? Well, thank you, Janet and uh, Matt, for this wonderful opportunity to speak to, to people who are passionate about STEM. Uh, first of all, as educators, we teach our children to think critically, to problem solve, to think outside of the box and to innovate. We teach them about the environment. We teach them about caring for others and protecting our future. They learn about technology and how to improve their lives using this technology. What is the point of preparing our students for a future if we have no intention of building one? The exploration of Mars, among many other endeavors like medical advancements, environmental solutions, economic improvements and social equality, etc., is an opportunity to put these skills into practical use to build a better future for all. And Nelson Mandela said it best, it is always, it always seems impossible until it is done. Now, if you take the last couple of months if these are anything to go by, and that includes tonight with the Inspiration for Mission, we will see far more civilian astro explorers stepping up to the plate. So when I tell students that they could become an astronaut in the future, it is no longer about motivating them. It's actually about probability. And not only that, who would have thought that space travel could become a mainstream activity? So why not look towards traveling towards Mars? And finally, I bring astronauts and space scientists out to South Africa to give students access to them. I want them to be exposed to role players in the space industry. And I do this in the hope that some of these students will become role players themselves. I do this because I would love us as a species to push the boundaries of exploration and Mars is one of those milestones. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and some of you may have caught uh, Steve's live contribution to H2M earlier today, as he did exactly what he was telling us uh, about just now, uh, making a space expert, uh, one of our speakers available to those uh, students. Um, it is an important message building that future. Let's go on now to Hunter Stanchak, who, uh, well, we had a little preview of uh, some of the images that you're about to see. Let's see if they knock your socks off as they have mine. Yeah, thank you everyone for having me be a part of this conversation. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, but I believe, you know, Mars is going to be possibly the most important undertaking of our lifetime because it's going to help us, you know, um, answer fundamental scientific questions. It's going to help satisfy our innate human desire for progress. And sort of like what Steve was alluding to, it's going to really inspire younger generations, you know, to explore science and space. So for me personally, the prospect of becoming a spacefaring multiplanetary civilization is uh, a great reason to get up in the morning. But I do believe that a crucial factor in achieving this is that we really need more people to feel this way. I believe millions more, in fact, really need to be interested in going to Mars. It needs to become culturally relevant and a shared dream amongst people because human will and imagination are immensely powerful forces. And when people are inspired, they can be galvanized to act and accomplish really amazing things. So at Colonize Mars, our vision is to catalyze the will of humanity to become multiplanetary. And we're doing this through the powerful medium of story. So if you, if you show the first slide, um, Colonize Mars is a blockchain-based simulation game that will allow players to participate in growing a, smart, a small Mars base into a self-sustaining city. And players will start by collecting digital trading cards, which represent vehicles, equipment, building, buildings, and astronauts that are useful on Mars. Um, here's a few examples. And all of our artwork is designed and, and drawn by our team. The cards are non-fungible tokens, which means they're each unique and tied to the blockchain. So players have true ownership of their digital card collections. Next slide. And each player's trading cards come to life through gameplay, which takes place on our website via an interactive 3D map. And players can use their cards to help maintain items within the Mars base to help um, ex organize expeditions outside the base and also 
eventually construct new buildings and equipment of their own. And the base will continue to expand over time. And our goal is to use the latest aerospace technology to inform mission payloads and objectives so that you know, players are educated on the real science needed to create a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. So what we're effectively doing is getting people to apply their intelligence and creativity to actual challenges of establishing a city on Mars via gameplay. And we chose the medium of gaming because we understand how many people are in the space and also how powerful it can be. And also sometimes that life really imitates art and that can push us all forwards. Um, for instance, in, in 1992, a, a novelist, Neil Stevenson, he wrote a book called Snow Crash. And in it, humans as avatars interact with each other and software agents in a virtual reality 3D environment. And he coined the name of the space, the metaverse. Well, recently, Mark Zuckerberg announced that Facebook has begun building the metaverse for real. So sometimes a compelling story can be the vehicle for new realities. And interactive stories like the one that we're building uh, we believe have the power to inspire millions of people and focus their will on making something like a, a mission uh, like Mars a reality. Thank you, Hunter. Game on. I love those images <laughs> on the cards. I, I want those as posters uh, in my in my home office. Um, Aaron Shepard, uh, engineer, science communicator, it's your turn. Okay, yes. So uh, like it's been stated, I am an engineer and that is about half of my personality. And that half of my personality is very analytical. I want numbers, I want data. So I'm gonna give you some data right now that really just, I think will bring the point home. There was a study done by Nature Magazine. I can't remember the exact year, it may have been 2011, but in that study, they noted that half of the scientists that published in Nature, ever cite the moon landing as the single event that inspired them to go into science. Think about that. Half of the research that was published in nature, research that has improved a lot of our lives, research that has directly saved people's lives was inspired by the moon landing, a major event, a major event in space. And so when you think about that, you know, Mars is the next step and it is the next generation. It is how many people will be inspired, not just to go into space, but to go into science, go into technology, to use their collective brain power to solve hard problems because they're seeing a live example of it now. I think that that will continue to improve lives. And I can't even imagine to think how many lives that will save in the future. And it, it's frustrating because a lot of times we're we're so stuck on what's going on here on Earth, but we don't see ahead and we don't see how space influences us and space inspires us. Now that's the engineer half of me. Now there is the communicator half of me who is the human, the artist, the, uh, if I could draw better, I'd probably be an artist too, but I've got software so I can do it in CAD instead. And in that half, I think about just the fact that exploration, it is an, kind of science -y, science me is popping out again, but it is encoded in our DNA. That is how we survived. That is how we evolved. We did not stay in one place. We went from place to place. We learned, we shared, we grew. And so when we look at Mars, the desire to travel there, the desire to be there, that is essentially who we are. And traveling to Mars enables us to be more fully human than we could ever possibly be. And I'm gonna say one thing too, and then I'm gonna wrap up. Um, I grew up a big fan of space flight my entire life. And for the longest time, I never really, like it, space was just this thing that I saw on TV. And I was like, oh wow, that was cool. But the moment, the moment that it became real to me was actually a few years ago. Um, I was at Humans to Mars in 2018 and I was at an event and I'm somehow, some way I'm sitting next to Buzz Aldrin. And I am looking at this guy three feet from me and I can look in this man's eyes. And when I see, I can see the fact that he went to the moon and back, I can hear him talk about it. The story all of a sudden goes from being this grainy footage that I used to see on TV in class to being real. And that is so inspiring and so powerful. And so I think when we go to Mars, it's not just about going to Mars, but it's about going to Mars and being able to bring people back who can tell the story, who can personify it, who can make it real for the rest of us. Because when we see that, that again, we are humans and we are built to connect in that way. So in short, going to Mars, again, like I said, allows us to be more human than we've ever been before. 
Thank you very much, Erin. Hey, uh, the TED Talks people were on the phone. They want to talk. Um, <laughs> Janet, it's your turn to uh, tell us as president of Explore Mars and a lifelong enthusiast, why Mars? You know, thank you to all of you. You've touched on hints of things that I think and believe are true. I'm going to build on what Aaron ended there with. It's like I've said for a long time as a lover of both art and science that we must make it our mission to honor creative thought as the birthplace of every scientific advancement and endeavor that has ever been or ever will be. Because in and through art and science are sewn the threads of understanding, exhibition, uh, exposition and innovation. And we must never forsake that discovery potential that is indelible when we give art and wonder and exploration a chance to do its most profound and scientific good. But I want to share my why Mars. My why Mars is this, because I believe in team human. Each of us, a thermodynamic miracle related to Earth chemically, each other biologically, and the universe atomically. We are ferociously cosmic, and we were designed to seek, to know, and to push the boundaries of our scientific and technical limits, and then push further. If indeed space is a team sport, as my friend Naeem Altoff of IBM said earlier today, then as access to space increases for us all, then what we innovate to thrive on Mars will thusly create extraordinary benefits for life and sustainability here on Earth and elsewhere. And that's when we begin to truly engage in this collective endeavor with that overview perspective that there is no great divide in the family of humanity. Then we will be a multi-planetary species. Then we will all have learned how to be the best of crewmates on this moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam and on Mars. And I live with this expectation of seeing my students living this in full reality. And that's my why Mars. Thank you so much, Janet. Absolutely outstanding, everyone. I'm supposed to give you my why Mars now. The truth is everything that I might have talked about has now been said far better than all of our other outstanding panelists. So I will steal other people's words. Uh, and I will begin with what Carl Sagan told us, among many other things. We are a way for the universe to know itself, to come to know itself. Um, that is a part of that cosmic connection that I think Janet has just addressed and that others of you touched on, whether you come at it from uh, the angles of art or science or uh, just our solidarity as a species. And then there are the two questions that my boss, the science guy, Bill Nye, likes to ask that, that he uh, got from other folks, including the great Bruce Murray, uh, one of our founders of the Planetary Society and a director of, the, of JPL who said, we are always after answering two great questions. Where do we come from and are we alone? And we can help to answer both of those questions and uh, bring it right back to our pale blue dot uh, by pursuing the red planet. Uh, and that is, I think, what this last three days has been about. I think it's what everything you've just heard has been about. And so uh, let's go, let's go to Mars. Uh, we're done with why now, at least, until May, when uh, Humans to Mars 2022 hopefully has all of us gathered together in Washington, D.C. So uh, keep track of exploremars.org to learn more about that as, uh, as preparations come together. And Janet, if you want to add anything to that about uh, plans for, uh, for May of next year, you certainly can. We also do now have, by my reckoning, maybe 15 minutes. If any of you out there have questions that you would like to share with us, you can put those right in the uh, chat window in Vimeo. And I don't see that, but those will, I believe, be relayed to me. Uh, and if they are not, we certainly have plenty of questions that we can address on our own. Janet, do you want to add anything to my little... Uh, tease there for uh, 2022? Well, we are certainly hopeful. It's May 17th through 19th, 2022. Uh, we are planning on being back at the National Academies of Science. Again, I know that through this week uh, weekend, there is a great promo code. You can get uh, go ahead and early register. You'll get um, nearly 50% off of that. So again, 
knock on my uh, standing desk here, I really do hope that we can participate in person because, you know, Aaron, hearing your story, the first time I met Buzz Aldrin was uh, in 2008 and he invited me to sit near and I remember looking at his shoes and I kept going, those feet have been on the moon. I was overcome with that. So when we say there's great connection that can happen here in little, you know, Brady Bunch boxes, seeing and being with one another in person is something I definitely am looking forward to. I love anybody's thoughts to just jump in on maybe what you heard other people say or to build on some of the ideas that, you know, have been presented in this last half hour. Anyone? Exactly where I was hoping to go. Yeah. What impressed you about what others said? I, I, while you think about it for a moment, I got to say my first, I think it was either my first or second encounter with Buzz. He threw me his car keys and asked me to move his car out of the space that I just told him that he was going to get a ticket if it stayed there. Nice uh, convertible sob, by the way. Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, maybe we can tackle this in order again, Jim. Well, I just, I think there's one thing that everyone said in a different way. Imagine touching Mars today because Mars has already sent his or her messengers to us. And just like Buzz touched the moon and we saw a new time frame for the evolution of our solar system, overnight we went from the Earth-centric view to actually the universe view with those first moon rocks as the measurements were made. Those Martian rocks that we've now been delivered to us by Mother Nature's magic are calling us. They're the messenger uh, they're not messenger DNA. They're the messengers of the Mars that we know could be. And look at what we're seeing in them. The scientists at some of our laboratories around the world, those women and men, they're seeing into the record books of time on Mars and it's all good. It's all a habitable time, a special time to ask that question, Matt, are we alone? So why don't we become the patients on Mars to quote our friends in the former Soviet Union as they go into space. Why don't we be the patients to go to Mars and learn ourselves what it's like to be explorers on that world, to build on that connection that we already have thanks to mother nature. So I think we're ready. It's just a question of let's do it. Greg, what did you hear that might've been new or, or maybe just stated something that you already believed, but uh, did it in a new way or a better way? Oh, well, um, so first I've enjoyed the, the, this panel and, and hearing uh, the perspective that, that everyone has had what I really enjoyed was the passion that everyone on here has. And so it, it's hard to get humans to Mars as we're in, in you know, as part of our moon to Mars effort within NASA. We know that, but the, the passion that you guys are bringing to this is really motivating me um, to, to really try to push to, to get there sooner than as soon as we can. So that's what I really appreciate about hearing you guys speak is, is just that deep passion that you have for it. I don't think we have a chance of getting there if we don't show that kind of passion and appreciate what my my boss, the science guy, calls the PB&J, the, the passion, beauty, and joy of space exploration. Um, let's see. Kavya, that would make you up next. Well, did you hear something novel? So I'll build on what Jim and Greg said. I am just so – I feel so grateful to be part of this community. Uh, Aaron talked about that you know, pretty much everyone talked about the human connectedness. We all come from the same stardust. Aaron talked about communication and how we want to motivate other people. And when I think about it, take a step back, like, you know, our planet with seven plus billion people here and just a handful of us around here and the difference we are able to make for the rest of the world. I cannot even imagine what if every single one of those 7 billion people really truly believed in what we are doing today and why we need to go to Mars. And, you know, I, I, I think, and that's why I said even previously, I think we're always like so focused on what we cannot do. But if we just step back and think about those possibilities of what we can do as humans, and which actually will bring us all together. And, you know, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, it's not in our imagination of what we're capable of reaching. And each and every one on this panel pretty much, you know, said the same with a different message. And I'm just so grateful to be part of this community. And I hope we can share our passion with 
you know, every single person on this earth. And that brings up a question that I will hold until we uh, finish this round. But uh, Steve, let's hear from you. Well, I think as, as the custodians of passion, uh, we have to ensure that we spread it far and wide because we need to make sure that people get the message that it's very important. But I think that Greg mentioned it. He said it was very difficult. Um, you know, well, let, let's go back to the early 60s and 50s. It was very difficult to get a rocket up into the air and then get it to fly to space. It was very difficult to get a rocket to go up to the wards of the moon. And then when problems occurred to get it back down to Earth. There are so many difficulties with regards to getting to Mars. But the fact is, we don't have a plan, planet B. We only have Earth. And if we don't start looking at alternatives, there could be a time, maybe not for our generation, but the generations to come, where we need options. And I think that it, it, it's wise and prudent to start looking at options now, looking at what we can and can't do in the future, when we start looking at planets, um, and I don't mean colonizing or settling, I'm just talking about maybe creating environments that that um, that push our boundaries to see what we could do about improving our lives here on Earth so that we wouldn't need a planet B. But if we do need a planet B, it would be nice to know that we have some sort of infrastructure there in case we need to get there. Hunter, what has made an impression on you as you've listened to all these uh, passionate Martians? Yeah, uh, one of the things that struck me was when Aaron was talking about how much of the research has been inspired by people who grew up um, in the Apollo era and saw the astronauts, uh, you know, land on on the moon. And I just, to me, um, imagine, you know, on TV, kids, you know, in school. Uh, younger you know, generations seeing the first people on Mars, what that will do, the intellectual capital that that will be, you know, produced as a result will far outweigh the cost of any space program. I mean, the engineers, the entrepreneurs, the scientists, the technologists that will come out of that will be incredible and it will push the human race forward um, in, in ways that I don't think we, we fully understand yet. And I think, sort of uh, like what Dr. Manipu was also saying is this is going to um, push us forward in, in ways that that is are, are going to be amazing for for us. And um, I think that that is one of the major reasons why Mars is so inspiring and why we getting to the, the red planet and uh, finding ways to live on it, finding ways to become self-sustaining will also bring a lot of those innovations home to Earth. And uh, Aaron, what struck you? Oh boy, this is hard because this whole thing has just been <laughs> awesome. And I, there are three points and I will try to keep this succinct. Um, first of all, uh, the most recent thing that resonated with me was actually what Dr. Kavya said, is that we're all saying the same thing, but in different ways. And when you think about it, that is the human experience. Um, if you spend enough time talking to people, it doesn't matter what country they're from or any of that. We all want the same things. And I feel like when you have a collective goal, like going to Mars, all of a sudden it's so big that it forces us to get out of the small mindset of, oh, well, you look different than me or you sound different than me. And I think that's important. Um, what Steve, Steve said something that really resonated with me, and that is providing access. Like, as a method to inspire, as a method to make Mars happen, part of what you have to do is provide access, especially to people that don't have it. I myself personally grew up in a very privileged community, but I know so many people that didn't. And I can go on, I have stories for days about people who just didn't have access to better things. And it crushes my heart because in those same people, there's so much potential. They're, the first Mars walker could be within one of those communities that typically don't get reached. And so one thing I really want to push for in this journey to Mars, and I hope that it's getting, and, or I'm sorry, I think the inherent nature of going to Mars pushes for this as well. It's just getting more people involved, getting more people, exposing more people to the mission, exposing more people to the story. And I think that will really help. And then finally, Hunter, uh, so I, first of all, I'm a big time gamer, so uh, I would definitely be downloading, but you said something about art and science and how they feed each other. And um, 
So one of the craziest things to me was um, I actually spent a few summers at Langley um, interning with one of the robotics teams. And I would literally be in meetings like with NASA scientists, like all, you know, top brains in the world. And we would say, oh yeah, let's do something like in that one movie or like in that one book or like in that one TV show. And so the art does feed the science. And so I'm really excited to see that, that happening with Mars now. And I think even putting it out in an artistic form, doing a game, doing a movie where Matt Damon gets stuck on the moon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that inspires people. That makes it real. That's a medium that people can digest. And so I, I just, again, so much awesomeness. It's very hard to make it succinct, but there were a lot, there was a lot that was said that just really resonated with me and that I hope we can carry forward and carry forward and spread out to the rest of the community. We are just about out of time. And that means that we are nearing the end of the 2021 Humans to Mars Summit as well. Uh, let's see if we can get through one more question. Uh, then this means it'll all the responses will have to be pretty brief, I'm afraid. But I and I don't want to shock any of you, but there are a number of people out there, a handful who aren't as passionate about space exploration as we are. Uh, and I bet you've all run into them, I certainly do. What have you found is the most effective thing that you can say or do to these folks? that at least maybe makes them think that uh, they should make a little bit of room among their priorities for this thing that we care so much about. Janet? You know, for me, it's just, if not now, when? And there are always going to be issues here on planet Earth that we need to deal with. I just want to keep everybody I guess I suppose I want to remind everybody that so much of what does what we create to go out there indelibly uh, is of benefit to all of humanity here on Earth. So every innovation, every attempt to go there teaches us about something that might improve life here. And for me, that is that transactional exchange. The reason to go is that it improves and is for the benefit of all here. Jim Garvin. Well, I, I think, and Janet, that's beautifully said. I think it's because we live in space so profoundly that we would not be here. Stephen Jay Cool said, if we played the tape backwards, we would not be here. Maybe the dinosaurs would be going to Mars. That would be cool. I can see a woolly mammoth on a big rocket. But that's it. We live in space. And that awareness of that space that we want to be part of is so intrinsic to how we are as people. We're a mobile species. And that mobility is not, is not confined to one place. And Mars is a place we can go to. We've been all talking about it. So since we live in space and it's collisional and frightening and cool, we have to go into space. And so if we don't, we're ignoring our own destiny and that's not good. So let's go. I know Kavya posted something in our little private chat here about how the dinosaurs are kicking themselves because they didn't have a space program. Uh, Greg? What do you tell people? Uh, well, uh, Janet read my mind. She, she stole the words I was going to say. So that was perfect <laughs> what she said. It, I mean, it, the investments we're making are investments in um, our, our, ourselves. You know, we're, it's, you know, looking at the dollars that we're investing. It, it's not throwing dollars away there. It's, it's investing in people here on Earth. So the things that we do out there is going to improve our life here. The things we learn uh, about space does that. So, I, But she said that much better than I could. <laughs> Kavya, it's your turn. What do you tell people you run into at uh, the supermarket uh, who uh, say, oh, space? I don't know why. <laughs> I loved how Janet put that. Uh, I would echo what she said in terms of investments back to her, especially from a medical standpoint, you know, and when I think about places that are, I've been, in, you know, that are struck with natural calamities and how we could help if we would have probably built closed loop life support systems, we would be helping them right now. And in addition to that, uh, what I do want to mention is, you know, we are now conscious about what we've done to our climate. I mean, climate change is real. But if you just step back and think about it from the dinosaur perspective, right? The planet will, is here to stay. Our planet Earth is here to stay, regardless of what we've done to it. It's us who are not going to be ex be surviving anymore. So it is in our duty to not only become conscious of what we've been doing to the planet, 
but how we can survive if, you know, and what I want to say is, uh, it, it, it is probably, I mean, if we are ignorant and we cannot do something, sure, fine. But if we want to stay ignorant and not do what we are capable of doing, I think that's a sin in my in my view. So just moving forward, I don't want to be a dinosaur and be extinct from this earth. And I wish they, they're probably thinking, you know, I, I wish we had a few people during or a few dinosaurs were thinking about expanding our species and they would be alive now. So we are here, you know, with such capabilities and we want to look at that next step. And as humans, it is in our DNA to explore and to grow beyond what we are today. And may that that thought continue. Steve, I'm going to get to you in just a moment, but I, I, I note that Jim has uh, pointed out, as many have in the past, that uh, we don't just uh, send dollar bills up into space. Uh, that money gets spent here, developing new technologies and uh, providing first rate jobs for hundreds of thousands of people. Steve, you must run into people who wonder why you do what you do. Whew, I'm so glad you asked this question. You just send those people that don't like STEM, you send them to me. When I hear someone tell me, you know, I really don't think ice cream is such a big deal, you let them lick it once and it's <laughs> over. I think that it's important to expose people to the ice cream, the science. If they see rockets launching, if they have an astronaut come along and they get to hear the personal account, if they get to be exposed to the real exciting aspects of science, it's a no-brainer. They will definitely fall in love with it. But more importantly, it is our job to educate people about the spin-offs of the space industry and how we have taken for granted the fact that we are watching this using fiber internet and satellite dishes and using cell phones. And all of those aspects would not be here if it were not for space uh, uh, space uh, endeavors. So I think it's very important that we educate people about the fact that they take life for granted because without those space endeavors, you wouldn't have all those wonderful things. And it's a safe bet that we wouldn't be talking to you live with uh, virtually no latency with a virtual space suit, uh, space helmet on your head. Uh, Hunter, I don't, I don't know, Hunter, if you get asked this question as much as the rest of our panelists, but uh, if you do, I mean, what what kind of message do you think should go to people? And I will apologize to Chris Carberry and others out there. We are in bonus time now, but I promise we'll be wrapping up in the next couple of minutes. Hunter, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing I'll, I'll say is is actually uh, the approach that, that we're trying to take is is saying less and showing more, really visualizing things, because I think it's so important and so many people in the world are visual learners. They're they experience things when they see an image or it, it inspires them and it, it makes them think about something or um, ask questions. And so the more that I think we can visualize Mars, visualize it in beautiful ways, different ways, show technology, show ways that um, what exploring Mars looks like, what, you know, um, doing different activities on Mars, how, how a base would look, things like that, um, it can really help excite people in new ways. And I think that, yeah, the, the visual to me has, has I, I've seen so many people be impacted by it. And I think the more that we can do that, the more we can express Mars through art, storytelling, um, gaming is, is really beneficial. You certainly seem to be doing your part. Aaron, you get the last word. How do you uh, share the PB&J with the people who don't feel it? Uh, well, first, briefly, I want to say that with this dinosaur conversation going on, my very vivid imagination, I just see like a T-Rex in a space suit, and he's like, ah! <laughs> um, but, okay, so I am uh, married to a teacher who is really smart, and I have learned the art of getting people to agree with you. Um, it, is, it has come from years of practice. And the one thing that I find that makes people really see your point of view is that you have to make it real for them. You have to take your, whatever frequency your brain is operating it on and modulate it to whatever their brain is operating on. And so a lot of times when we talk about, well, why space? Why send the money? Like I always tell people this because, and, and I can usually find a common point. So one is um, breast cancer is a very big thing here. Yes. 
we, we all know somebody, we all know of somebody who has had to deal with that in their lives. Well, space technology directly helps to diagnose that. It helps to diagnose it faster. Space technology, stuff that we used in the Hubble is saving lives down here at a exponential rate. And it wouldn't be that way without space. But people don't know that because oftentimes we're like, oh yes, yeah, space, it's awesome. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be that way, but I think when we run into people who are like, well, no, I don't understand. You just have to ask them why. What are they stuck on? Is it, do they think it's a waste of money? Do they think it's a social waste? Um, I can tell you one more story and then I know we gotta go. But during the time of the Apollo program, there was a little thing going on called the civil rights movement. And so half the country or a large percentage of this country of people that looked like me just did not care about space. And I think had they known that the space program actually pushed for civil rights through the story of Katherine Johnson, through the story of some of the early engineers at Marshall, it would have made it a lot more, they would have been able to understand it. It would have related to people more. They would have supported it more. And so it is about finding those things, finding where the hangup is with each individual person and addressing it. Because we all know that space fits everywhere, but it's just getting other people to see that. And usually it's only one or two things that have people stuck on, well, why are we going to space? So, yeah. I'd like to think that the arc of that rocket uh, is bending toward justice. Um, caveat, you asked to get in for a couple more seconds. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to add to Aaron, which uh, I, I meant to mention when I was talking about this. The first thing I would ask people, I mean, you know, when they ask me about space, I would ask, would you be able to live without your iPhone or would you be able to live without the internet or see your kids or grandkids around the world without space exploration? I mean, that's the tangible point that just shows what space exploration has done for all of humanity, just bringing us much more closer. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for making this once again a great way to finish a Humans to Mars Summit. Uh, I sure hope to see all of you in May, and I hope also to see a lot of you at the uh, launch party, the Explore Mars, or launch, Explore Mars launch party uh, that is just a few hours away as we wait for the launch of Inspiration4. Janet, president of Explore Mars, I'm going to throw it back to you to uh, close out the summit. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you all so much. Uh, I just got a message that uh, Inspiration4 is suiting up. The countdown has surely uh, begun. We are about to watch history in the making. We get to cheer on our fellow board member and friend, Dr. Cyan Park. Uh, Proctor, along with her other many friends, uh, the benefit of to St. Jude and everything. Uh, caveat to your point, I always go, do you like your GPS? Do you like knowing that when weather storms are happening? Again, other great uh, contributions of NASA and the space program. As we close out our time with all of you today, Thank you. I think the reason I love ending with this Why Mars panel is because we want to leave you all on this up note, on this moment of inspiration that you are the ambassadors of Mars. I now dub you all an official Explore Mars ambassador and you go out there and you become the your own evangelist of space exploration. You become those mentors that say yes when a school kid asks you, can you meet with me and talk to me about space? That is how we advance this. That is how we keep telling our students that this is possible. And to all my NASA peeps, you can't quit. You got to find ways, you got to find the funding because Steve and I and Aaron and many of us are out here, many of the educators I know, we're telling kids this is their future. Please, why Mars? Because our kids deserve this. We promised it to them and we cannot fail them. And so with that, I thank you all for your time. We will see you shortly. Please join us for our live stream. You can see us on YouTube or Explore Mars Facebook page, but please celebrate tonight's launch. Thank you so much for your attendance and we will see you surely in May of 2022. Bye everyone. And here's our grand live long and prosper the perfect socially distanced handshake.